All right. Thank you so much for being here. I have with me today, Dr. Ryan Malone from First Urology. Um, he's gonna help us a little bit understand how to use uh, Microgen DX microbiome testing in a clinical context. So Dr. Malone, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Um, you said earlier to me that you've been using Microgen testing for about three and a half years in your practice. What sort of prompted you to consider trying something new like this in your practice? Uh, the genesis with our practice was the inability with outpatient urine culture testing to get any um, data about um, ESBL uh, from LabCorp and that sort of thing. So we were looking at different ways to try to determine uh, resistance. Uh, we were seeing patients with E. coli that would come back and we would have cultures that say they should have been treated adequately. And we were introduced to this technology as, in that research. So we started using it. And as you uh, will see on one of the reports, we'll take a look at that um, there's some resistance gene data that can be gleaned um, as part of the reporting process. Um, and that, that was the, uh, the way it was initiated within our practice. That's great. So that gets at sort of the next question I wanted to discuss, which is who the patients are that you think are really benefit that you use this test kind of testing for. So initially it was uh, our recurrent urinary tract infection patients. Um, and it's, it's evolved a little bit uh, from that where we're now using it in our uh, chronic and acute prostatitis patients after a, uh, an exam. Um, and then we'll have them do a post-exam voided urine and send. Um, we do not send it on our routine uncomplicated urinary tract infection patients. Um, the pelvic pain patients where the urine is maybe shows a little something, but it's not terribly helpful that we are all used to seeing negative or below threshold urine cultures. Oftentimes you can find bacteria with this. Um, so, um, I would say that's uh, 90 plus percent of the patients we send them on. So then for your patients with the uncomplicated cystitis, are you treating those patients presumptively or are you tending to just use your standard clinical culture unless you know they've got some sort of complicated situation? Empiric treatment and then send the culture for confirmation. Um, if they it. fail that treatment and they come back, that's a situation where we might then send a microgen if they don't respond appropriately. Got it. And do you use this as a office-based collection or do you ever use it on like a home-based situation? Do you ever give it to patients to send in directly from home? Well, it's, uh, it's interesting. We never did until COVID. And uh, I think with COVID, everybody became a little bit creative. Um, and we had a courier situation where we could send a kit and have them collect and then uh, send it back in. Um, we've We've discouraged that uh, because we felt like we were getting much better samples, especially in the females, if it was a catheterized specimen, um, so that we could limit the number of lactobacillus that we were seeing uh, in the reports. Um, oh, that's but, great. That's, that's really interesting to hear. So you, you tend to use this as a catheterized specimen for the patients? For, so that for you females. Get for right. females, right. So that right. you're not getting an over-detection of sort of vaginal or other urogenital flora? You know, it's so specific and picks up basically any bacterial DNA that um, avoided specimen, I think, is um, has its faults uh, specific mm -hmm. to this because of the specificity. Um, so, yeah, we, we do catheterized specimens when we collect them in females. No, that's really interesting. We did a little study in our clinic looking at the, the sensitivity of microscopic hematuria data and found that what was interesting is that people who came into the urologist office, I think they were just more aware of how they behaved in the, when they were there to get their urine tested, that our samples were always better quality than when they were obtained in other places. So I think that is a really interesting point that not only is there a difference between um, collection just based on catheterization, but just having having control over how that specimen is processed probably does influence what you get out of the results. Um, I think that's important because even in uh, the patients that we have that self-cath, uh, we find that if they, you know, use betadine, for instance, um, if they don't allow it to dry a little bit, that it actually contaminates the specimen and you'll get a false negative. So th there are some 
small nuances that are easy to overcome, but you do need to know about them to collect properly. So let me ask one more question before we kind of get into the, the report itself. Mm -hmm. um, how easy was it for your practice to kind of adopt the use of this technology or this kind of testing when you first started out doing it? Um, in terms of uh, ease of use, I think it was, um, it's certainly easy to order in terms of putting uh, the order in our EMR. I think the learning curve of who is it appropriate for and then how do you interpret the result because it's a lot of information that comes back on the report. Um, once you learn to uh, sift through those things, it became, you know, quite easy. That's great. And, and I guess then you, you kind of alluded to this here. So learning who to order, order these tests for, have you, I guess that's kind of the question in my mind is, since I've never used this myself, Mm -hmm. For those patients that you mentioned, the recurrent UTI ones, there's obviously mm -hmm. a great utility in being able to get those resistance genes, especially back faster. But for that, say, patient pain, that pain population that you mentioned earlier, and how right. they have those sort of equivocal results, you're not sure what to do with them. What's sort of your, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, data driven, but what's your sort of gestalt of how, how that's worked out for you in treating that patient population using um, micro, microbiome sort of directed therapy in that group of patients? So uh, it's actually been really interesting. And, um, you know, in a, I guess, lazy or busy private practice, I haven't compiled the data, but um, <laughs> it seems that when a pelvic pain patient comes in and I don't know that answer, I, I look for it because if they come in with pelvic pain and it's infection related, I'm going down a different path than if I have a negative microbiome data, I know that, that I'm not chasing the right thing to try to treat them. So, you know, a patient who comes in labeled with interstitial cystitis, um, they may or may not have that. And I, I rely on this test heavily as an initial screening tool to tell me which path to go um, to try to help them. So it's actually more of a decision tree kind of point for, for you to pain, say. Yeah. If this, if a patient who's, you know, clinical culture negative, but they still have this, these symptoms that feel kind of like infection, if the microbiome or the microgen DX test comes back negative, you're saying, no, we got to go other ways. If it comes right. back positive, then you'll go down that path of trying to treat the potential infectious involvement here. Try to sterilize them and see if that is the source of their pain. Correct. Got it. Does and the same sometimes... thing go for the, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, sometimes it's important to be able to prove that to the patient as well, because they have a trouble accepting that they don't have recurrent infections. And how about the prostatitis patients? Is it sort of a similar pathway for you or is that different? I would say it's similar. I guess I don't have any comparison in the uh, prostate population of patients to where um, uh, I don't know what uh, what a false negative rate is after an exam and avoided specimen for a microgen, I feel very comfortable when it's positive. Um, when it's negative, I think, um, you know, if we try the usual suspects, it might be worth uh, rechecking it at some point along the pathway if they're not responding appropriately. Mm -hmm. That's great. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at a sample uh, test okay. report that maybe you can take us through sort of what you're looking at. All right. All right, can you can you see there's sort of a yes. all right, so I'm looking at this level level two report, and we have a couple different areas that are labeled with some numbers. I think they'll maybe help us go through some things. So the first thing that you mentioned was uh, you know, you started using this test based on the ability to detect some resistance genes. So we kind of see that at the top. There are a bunch of these resistance genes listed. How do you use that information? Well, so the way that um the information works on the bacteria that are listed in uh, three, uh, labeled 3A and 3B. Uh -huh. um, they don't, it's not the traditional technology where the bacteria are tested against a specific antibiotic. They rather look at a cataloged historical data of that bacteria and what it should respond to. They then look at what resistance genes are present in the urine specimen and we eliminate those antibiotics as choices for treating this particular group of bacteria. The, the pool of bacteria, the community of bacteria that are there can share those resistance genes. 
So if you have an E. coli, for instance, that is historically sensitive, uh, in this case, to methicillin, but maybe the enterococcus is methicillin resistant, then there's a high likelihood that that resistance gene is passed among those bacteria. So you would not want to use methicillin as your uh, sole choice in treating within this particular specimen. So you use it as a uh, sort of a global collaborative view instead of each individual line. Maybe the best thing to do is to ask you when you get this report, what, what do you look at first and how do you sort of go through, go through the data you see here? Yeah, so uh, what I look at, number one, is the number of bacteria. Um, and then I look to see if it's, it looks like it's loaded with uh, typical contaminants, such as if the first two were different species of lactobacillus, I would question the collection method. Uh -huh. um, and, and look back at the chart and see if that seems likely. Um, I then uh, would scroll over to the antibiotic choices. And one of the things that Microgen has done over time with their level two report, if you see on the very far right, excuse me, on the very far right, there are some grayed out boxes. Mm -hmm. and antibiotics that are listed in red, those are the ones that correlate to the resistance genes. So I eliminate those as choices to treat these bacteria. So of the ones that are in the white columns, I would then choose, uh, we've, we've made it a policy within our practice that we don't like to treat with more than two antibiotics at a given time. Okay. And microbiologically, um, after discussing with some of my microbiology colleagues, um, the rationale for this, if you break up the community of bacteria, they're often symbiotic. So if you can eliminate the top players, often the lower percentage or lower represented bacteria won't survive. So we limit to two antibiotics and try to hit the top ones in the order they're listed because they're listed by representation of volume. So what I would Got do it. in a patient like this, assuming no allergies, is I would look at this line and I would uh, struggle a little bit because it's such small print. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I would likely uh, try, to, try to go with orals. Um, uh, let's see, something like, it would be simple to treat this patient with macrobit and doxycycline, for instance, you're gonna take out the top two. And in a case like that, there are some, there's some argument to be made that maybe that's a patient who comes back and gets a repeat culture to see what you've done to that community of bacteria. I like to look at that a little more practically and if they come back and their symptoms are resolved, I don't send the test again. Um, we're not completely in agreement within our practice about that. That's become a practitioner choice. Um, well, that's, I mean, that's, that's obviously a huge challenge is you're going to sure. probably, hopefully you'll see a change and, but what kind of changes is adequate um, to sort of rule out bacterial infections still being the causative issue. And I guess part of that also comes down to looking at the bacterial load. Do you, do you ever sort of consider that as well in your decision-making? You know, less and less, to be honest, because I'm not normally sending um, a microgen on an asymptomatic patient um, at, for, for surveillance. So I guess my logic um, to support that would be I'm sending it because they're symptomatic. So I'm going to treat what I see regardless of volume um, mm -hmm. is sort of the way I interpret that. Got it. Um, I, anything else you want to tell me about what you look at in these reports? Because I think you've kind of gone through how you approach it. So here you're not necessarily focusing on, say, treating that Enterococcus faecalis down below because it's such a small component. You're really focusing right. on the major players, trying to obliterate those and thinking that those minor species are going to go with the rest of the, the crowd there. Um, anything else you kind of look at just to make sure we, we cover the whole thing? No, I think on the report that covers it, I think you can really get caught up in trying to eliminate everything on the report. And um, mm -hmm. I, I guess my feeling uh, over time after using the test is that um, you, uh, you can get really hung up on putting people on multiple, multiple antibiotics at the same time. And I just don't think it's necessary. Um, 
it it could become that way, but that's in a very refractory patient that you're going to be doing multiple cultures on to see if you're having an impact on this bacterial uh, colony, you know, this, this groove or, or pool of bacteria to see if you're having an impact on them with the ones you've chosen. Right. Um, the particularly difficult patients have been the um, elderly uh, female patients who don't empty their bladder, who will initially yeah. have seven or eight bacteria, you treat some, they come back, they're still symptomatic. And on a few that I have chased um, multiple times, what I find is that it may take three or four of these tests to really whittle it down. And ultimately you'll find that you started with seven bacteria and then the next time maybe it's five and then it's three. And, you know, it, it's not a one round thing for a lot of patients, but they're not coming to the urologist because they have a simple infection. Right. What's been this sort of patient response to using this kind of technology? Uh, very positive. The negative to the technology is that I don't get the final result, this level two report for about a week um, because it gets sent out. Um, so in a patient who's acutely ill or toxic, um, you know, you're going to treat them empirically and you don't get a result as quickly as you would with the routine culture. So um, there's some frustration with the speed, um, mm -hmm. but patients have been very um, receptive to trying something different um, because they, if they're coming to see you for recurrent infections, they've got a whole host of urine cultures that they've had performed. They haven't responded. Yeah. Is there, is there any, you mentioned sort of that, you know, when you have that pelvic pain patient and you get this positive result that you'll kind of go down this road, is there any point at which you sort of abandon this as a, as a strategy and start thinking about other approaches or are you really trying to, to get this more sterilized? And if that's still not helping, then you can kind of figure out that it's not this. Well, what's interesting is um, a number of patients, uh, again, I can't quote you percentages, but patients who come in with recurrent urinary tract infections and I'll send one of these and it's negative and they're symptomatic. It, it's actually sort of the opposite where I then start going down the path of treating their pelvic pain and not chasing infection and yeah. say, look, I, I understand you have symptoms, but it's not infection causing it. So, so sometimes it's a great way, to kind, of, yeah. great way to kind of help patients kind of accept, I guess, that, that, that some of their symptoms may not be due to infections and we need to follow some other, other approaches. Right. That's right. great. Thank you so much for your time. This is sure. really helpful. I'm really, I've learned so much and I, and I'm so excited to, to continue to see how the technology evolves. I'm, I'm curious. I think that probably the timing issue that you spoke about may, may get better as the technology gets better and, and the Agreed. testing gets more expansive. Um, so I'll be excited to see that also improving in the future. Um, thank you again for your time. It was really wonderful to speak with you today. No, thank you.